I also am incredibly grateful to introduce to you next uh, Dr. MJ Malloy. Uh, MJ and I, um, we actually um, met um, sitting at a hotel bar. Um, I think some of the greatest relationships could potentially start that way. But it wasn't because we were sitting there interested in drinking. Um, we had a shared passion in multiple sclerosis, and we both came from a place of understanding how this particular illness can have tremendous impacts upon a person's well-being and health and happiness, and we really bonded over the, the truth truth of the struggle in dealing with difficult conditions. Uh, my respect for this man has only grown uh, exponentially as I've seen the work that he's done and everywhere I look, this man is doing his best to put the science and the heart together so that we can understand how we can make a difference. Officially, we'll say um, MJ Malloy, he is an epidemiologist, a research scientist at the BC Centre on Substance Use and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at UBC. He's the principal investigator of the ACCESS study, a prospective cohort of more than 1,100 people who use illicit drugs and are living with HIV. He's published more than 175 scientific papers. I don't know about you, but going through university or even high school, writing that one essay, you know, that was pretty tough and we probably did it at the last minute. I don't think you can do that when you're this, this caliber of researcher. His research has appeared in top journals such as Addiction, AIDS, and The Lancet. More recently, his research has focused on evaluating the use of cannabis to improve the health and well-being of people living with substance use disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. MJ Malloy. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to be here, my first time in Kamloops. I hope to come back. Uh, and, and it's wonderful to be here because I think Michael has really um, managed to gather us together here today, a like-minded community uh, of people who want to do more uh, to help those in our community and those among us uh, who suffer from substance use disorder uh, and, and, their, uh, and their plight. Uh, and I certainly, uh, though, want to uh, uh, start with an apology because I will have to uh, leave directly after uh, my talk to join Stephanie and others in Edmonton uh, at uh, the Stimulus Conference uh, to share some of this information with them as well. But in the time that uh, I have with you, uh, what I would like to do, and I'm very grateful for my, to Michael uh, and his team for the ability uh, and the opportunity to share with you some of the research that we've been doing uh, in Vancouver uh, to try and learn more about uh, the role of cannabis uh, in the health and well-being of people who use other drugs uh, and uh, in the health and well-being of people who are at risk uh, of overdose. Uh, before I start, I do want to disclose where all of my money comes from, uh, just so you uh, uh, get a sense of, of what my biases might be. Uh, I do receive money from the United States government, as well as from a number of uh, licensed producers of cannabis. Uh, so hopefully Mr. Trump uh, and his border guards will not find that out anytime soon. Um, uh, but I'm obviously grateful for that support, uh, and it has um, uh, supported some of the research that you're about to see today. And it's really difficult to follow Dr. Lake, uh, not only for the tremendous example uh, he has shown all of us uh, as uh, the type of politician who is, in my view, all too rare, uh, someone who will follow the evidence uh, and make the decisions based on evidence uh, to help uh, individuals uh, in our society who are far too often stigmatized and powerless. Uh, and unfortunately, we have an opportunity now to do that again. Uh, and to try and uh, follow the evidence uh, to uh, intervene uh, in what I think is probably the, the defining public health catastrophe of our age. Uh, we have lost far too many of our fellow citizens, of our family members, of our lovers, uh, our loved ones, uh, to uh, in an entirely preventable cause of death, uh, opioid overdose. This is, you know, not one uh, uh, crisis, but a number of intertwined crises, uh, which have to do with things uh, as disparate as the overprescription of painkillers uh, and the contamination of our illicit drug supply with fentanyl. What they all have in common, though, uh, is that deaths from overdose are completely preventable. And fortunately, scientists uh, have come up with a number of interventions, both for people suffering from, over, from an overdose, uh, as well as people living with opioid use disorder, uh, to try and uh, uh, limit uh, and mitigate the harms of opioid use. Uh, and fortunately, here in British Columbia, as I've mentioned, uh, we have uh, uh, seen both with the, pre the previous and the current government um, uh, the, the, the ability to enact some of those evidence-based uh, approaches. Unfortunately, it's also clear that new approaches are necessary. 
Uh, and so this is really the evidence that I want to show you today. It's some preliminary evidence that we've gathered in Vancouver uh, about the possible use of cannabis uh, as an intervention in the opioid crisis. Many of us are here and many of us started on this journey around cannabis uh, because of work uh, like this, uh, which was published in 2014. Uh, and this is really a landmark paper because it was one of the first to really broach the question, uh, could cannabis uh, and could cannabis legalization uh, be an important intervention uh, to mitigate the risk of overdose? And quite briefly, what the, artist, what the, uh, the scientists did here was look at rates of opioid overdose death between 1990 and 2010. Uh, and they looked at the states uh, that had medical cannabis systems or not, uh, and they found that the states with some form of licit access to medical cannabis uh, had approximately 25% lower rates of opioid overdose compared to states that did not. Moving on, in 2018, uh, a similar study was published uh, in the American Journal of Public Health, uh, which even more clearly demonstrated the possible benefits of cannabis legalization on rates of overdose. This study uh, reports the number of overdose deaths in the state of Colorado uh, from 2000 to 2015. Of course, in 2014, uh, Colorado legalized the non-medical use of cannabis. Uh, and as you can see there, it appears that there is an immediate uh, down uh, tick uh, in the numbers of opioid um, uh, fatalities. Now, as an epidemiologist, I'm probably legally obligated to tell you that this evidence is certainly very suggestive certainly very inspiring, but certainly not conclusive. Uh, and what I will try to do in the rest of the time that we have together is talk about some of the evidence that we've generated in Vancouver, which I hope has, has moved us a bit further along uh, in understanding the possible benefits of cannabis for people at risk of overdose. Before I get there, though, I do want to mention uh, that obviously um, uh, our colleagues in preclinical medicine uh, have uh, uh, identified several uh, possible benefits of cannabis and several um, uh, uh, ways in which manipulation of the endocannabinoid system, which is the body's, one of the body's regulatory systems, uh, is deeply implicated in many of the, the processes that we understand to be involved with addiction and drug use. So now we turn to what we've been doing uh, for the last number of years in Vancouver. And the data that I'm going to show comes from three of our studies at the BC Centre on Substance Use, uh, involving over 2,500 individuals uh, who use illicit drugs uh, and are at risk of opioid overdose. Many of these individuals live in the downtown east side uh, and uh, as such uh, cope with, with many uh, uh, threats to their health and well-being, uh, including criminalization and marginalization uh, that goes along with their uh, illicit drug use patterns. The three studies are VITUS, uh, which is the Vancouver Injection Drug User Study. It started in 1996 uh, as a scientific attempt to try and understand why in the downtown east side, so many people were acquiring HIV, uh, even though then as now it had a very large uh, ne sterile needle distribution system. In addition, there is the ARISE study, which involves street-involved youth, largely living in the downtown south area of Vancouver. Uh, and then, of course, the greatest cohort, the best cohort, my cohort, uh, I, I'm being overly modest, uh, uh, access, which is HIV positive, people who are living with HIV uh, who are also illicit drug users. This, is, this represents, these 2,500 individuals, represents one of the largest uh, and longest running uh, scientific studies into illicit drug use uh, in, in North America and in, and in uh, the Western world. Uh, and because of these studies, we've, we've uh, generated evidence um, uh, about why people uh, uh, acquire HIV and other bloodborne pathogens, uh, and as well the, the benefits of harm reduction interventions. The studies all operate the same way. We, enter, we uh, uh, recruit individuals from the community, from needle exchanges, from the open drug market, from Insight, the supervised injection facility. And then uh, at recruitment, and then every six months thereafter, individuals complete a long two or three hour questionnaire with, a, with an interviewer. Uh, and then uh, a nurse takes uh, blood for CD4 and viral load if they're living with HIV, uh, or HIV and HCV antibodies if they are uh, HIV uh, negative. These questionnaires elicit data on drug use patterns, on housing, on incarceration, uh, anything we think might uh, uh, be plausibly affecting the health and well-being of people who use drugs. 
in about 2013 or 2014, we began to be very interested in the possible role of cannabis uh, in the health and well-being of individuals. And it is a not-too-secret secret in academia that many of uh, uh, the best ideas come from our graduate students, uh, and here was no exception. Uh, uh, Stephanie Lake, who you've already met, uh, was one of the uh, uh, graduate students who really pushed the idea of us looking at cannabis and trying to understand better how cannabis was used by people in our cohorts. So this is one of the questions we began to ask people. Are you substituting one drug for another? to try and get at the idea that individuals may be using marijuana, may be using cannabis uh, as a substitute, as a lower risk substitute. These are the first numbers that we produced and they were quite surprising because the, uh, the, the, the table, the figure here uh, indicates the drug that is being substituted for. And when we began to ask the question, of course we expected individuals to be substituting opioids for cannabis. But in fact, what we found was that the substance most often substituted by individuals was crack cocaine. And things got even more interesting when we began to look at uh, uh, patterns of cocaine use, crack cocaine use, before, during, and after those periods of intentional use of cannabis to substitute for crack cocaine. And in a statistical model that was published in that paper, uh, we found that after periods of intentional cannabis use, uh, the likelihood that someone was reducing their frequency of crack use was 89%. In other words, there was uh, 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 strong signals that individuals using cannabis intentionally were managing to reduce their crack cocaine use. And in fact, in approximately a quarter of these individuals, they eliminated their crack cocaine use altogether. We were certainly very interested by this because as you know, there is no accepted pharmacotherapy for crack cocaine use. Uh, and many of the um, uh, uh, interventions for people suffering with crack cocaine use disorder are, are not very effective. So we began to ask uh, our participants uh, in much longer form ethnographic interviews what cannabis meant for them and what role cannabis played in their own health. And here is one of the things we learned. This was from uh, an indigenous woman, 27 years old, a street youth participant. And she said that being on drugs for such a long period of time is like, that's how you're normal. And now when I stopped using, like I'm still having a hard time adjusting. It's really hard to deal with and that's why I started smoking weed. And so her report was similar to many other reports that we were hearing from our participants, was that for them, uh, they used cannabis as part of an ad hoc but intentional strategy to try and protect their health and well-being and to try and reduce the harms that come from other drug use. So we followed up with some more studies looking at the street youth cohort. And these are, uh, as I mentioned, about a thousand individuals who, who use illicit drugs, uh, who are younger people who are living on the street. Uh, and when we recruit them, approximately half of them have yet to initiate injection drug use. And you can imagine, of course, that initiating injection of drug use is a very important event uh, as it automatically increases the risk individuals have of, of acquiring HIV, of acquiring hep C, and of course of suffering an overdose. Mindful of the gateway strategy, or the gateway hypothesis, we began to look at the relationship between cannabis and injection initiation. And what we found, in fact, was that among approximately 481 participants who, when they first were recruited into the study, were injection naive, when we followed them forward over time, uh, we found, in fact, that cannabis was significantly associated with initiating injection. But it was a protective factor. And by that, I mean periods of, of frequent daily cannabis use were 34%, in these periods, individuals were 34% less likely to initiate injection. So in contrast to the gateway hypothesis, which of course I learned as a small child, which means that you start with cannabis and then you inevitably and ultimately follow through and to use more, uh, 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 more dangerous and harder drugs. Uh, in fact, in this cohort, we found evidence of the opposite that individuals appeared to be using cannabis, or rather individuals who were using cannabis uh, were initiating injection drugs at a far slower rate than their peers who were not using cannabis uh, as often or at all. 
Of course, engagement in opioid agonist therapy uh, is one of the most important uh, tools we have to lower the risk uh, of someone who is living with opioid use disorder uh, to suffer a, a fatal overdose. Uh, and many clinicians and healthcare providers who are providing opioid agonist therapy to these individuals, there's been a, a, a long-term uh, concern about the role of cannabis uh, in their healthcare engagement. And previous studies, uh, especially from studies where cannabis is not decriminalized uh, and where there is not as much of a, I would argue, uh, uh, open-minded uh, views uh, on the parts of healthcare providers towards cannabis, some of those studies have indeed found that cannabis use is a risk factor for people to stop taking their opioid agonist therapy, their methadone or their suboxone. So what we did uh, is we went into our, into our data to look, in fact, uh, at what the relationship was between um, starting opioid agonist therapy and being retained on therapy. Uh, and this includes data all the way back to 1996, so over 20 years of data. And that we found that there was about 810 individuals who uh, initiated opioid agonist therapy during that time period. Uh, and that we found that among those who were using cannabis every day, they were 21% more likely to still be engaged in opioid agonist therapy uh, in, in, uh, at the six month period provided that they were using cannabis. So again, this is a very interesting finding. Uh, because it seems to suggest uh, that cannabis, far from uh, interfering uh, with an individual's engagement in opioid agonist therapy, appears to be uh, uh, an adjunctive therapy, appears to be helping individuals to stay on their methadone maintenance or their suboxone, thus lowering, dramatically lowering their risk of overdose. Obviously, in 2014 and 2015, like others, we began to realize the real threat posed by fentanyl and carfentanyl uh, on the health and indeed on the lives of our research participants. And so what we began to do in 2016 uh, was uh, 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 augmenting our data collection uh, with um, urine drug screens so that we could understand uh, more precisely what in fact individuals were being exposed to in the increasingly toxic drug supply. And between 2016 and November 2017, uh, we uh, conducted about 3,000 interviews with over 1,500 individuals. Uh, and with those interviews, we also did urine drug screens. Uh, and it's important to note that approximately a third of those screens were positive for fentanyl. Uh, and approximately 40% were positive for THC. Certainly, uh, uh, one of the first lessons was that although uh, uh, approximately a third of the screens were positive for fentanyl, uh, it was a much lower proportion of individuals who believed that they had been exposed to fentanyl. Uh, really uh, illuminating the risks of unintentional fentanyl exposure. When, and this is unpublished data, uh, so this is something I'm sharing with you before it has gone through peer review. Uh, but I think the message, though, is still quite clear. When we, be, when we began to look uh, at the uh, 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 exposure to fentanyl, what we found uh, is that those tests that were positive for fentanyl, they were approximately 54% less likely uh, to be positive for THC. So clearly, uh, uh, the, the association here uh, is that individuals who were using THC uh, were far less likely to be exposed to fentanyl uh, compared to their peers who were not positive for THC. And I think more interestingly, uh, and this is a, a paper that we have submitted for review, which is currently undergoing review and I hope to be published very soon, we found that individuals uh, during that time period, during the time period of the rise uh, of fentanyl, uh, in the last number of years. We found that individuals who told us uh, in our cohort studies that they were using cannabis at least every day uh, were approximately 55% less likely to also report that they had experienced a non-fatal overdose in the same period. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's interesting, but what that probably is is simply the people using cannabis uh, are at lower risk for overdose for some other reason. Maybe the strength of their addiction is less, maybe they're using less opioids, et cetera. But I would like to point out that this estimate uh, is from a statistical model which also includes other risk factors for overdose. Homelessness, using prescription opioids illicitly, using heroin every day, and using methamphetamine every day. So even individuals with these risk factors for overdose, some of the most important risk factors there are, individuals who are using cannabis are 55% less likely to overdose at that, at that same time period.
Now, of course, there are limitations to this work, as with any scientific work. Our cohorts are not randomly recruited, and so we can't say that they're necessarily representative uh, of the larger downtown east side or BC population. And of course, some of our drug use is self-reported. And, and most importantly, I think we don't know uh, to any degree what people might be using in terms of the cannabis dose, uh, what type, what the route of administration is, uh, and the like. And of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that, is that this is observational interview data. This is not data from a randomized controlled trial, which would allow us to know with much more certainty about the causal, the possible causal relationship uh, between cannabis overdose and fentanyl exposure. But I think we can still conclude a number of things. Uh, in our study of individuals who are at very high risk for overdose, using cannabis is very common. Between uh, approximately 40 to 50 percent of the individuals are using cannabis every day. Uh, and whereas, I think in an earlier era, we might just say, oh well, you know, these individuals are using it recreationally to get high. Uh, in fact, what I think our data shows is that for at least some of our participants, Canada, uh, cannabis uh, is a part of a strategy, uh, an intentional conscious strategy to try and reduce the risks of harms uh, posed by their use of other substances. And the other thing I think which is quite promising uh, is that our study suggests that there are multiple ways in which cannabis uh, might help individuals lower their risk of overdose. For example, uh, uh, reducing the likelihood that they begin to inject, reducing the likelihood that they are exposed to fentanyl, uh, and increasing the likelihood that they'll stay on methadone and suboxone, which remains uh, our best medical intervention to lower the risk of overdose for people with opioid use disorder. What's next? Uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, I hope that you'll agree that our findings uh, support quite urgently the need uh, to uh, do uh, the sorts of experimental, randomized controlled trials uh, among humans to see whether or not cannabis might be added uh, to the pharmacopoeia for people who are suffering from opioid use disorder. And these trials might answer the questions such as, you know, are they effective at reducing the risk of overdose? Uh, how do they work? What might the optimum dose or type of cannabis might be? Uh, and what might the possible adverse effects be? As in any other area of medicine, we need the randomized trials uh, to really answer these very pressing public health and clinical questions. And so I'm very pleased to say uh, that we have um, uh, managed to secure some funding to do this kind of trial work, and I hope that it will begin uh, not too soon uh, in, the, in the, the turn of 2019. But as with many things uh, in the crisis and with drug use itself, uh, fortunately activists uh, and community activists are not waiting for us scientists and clinicians to come up with answers. Uh, Sarah Blythe, who, who Terry has already introduced us to, uh, as, indeed has, has taken her overdose prevention sites uh, and she has begun trying to uh, 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 distribute cannabis uh, in the hopes of augmenting um, uh, uh, her uh, attempts to lower the risk of overdose uh, among people living in the downtown east side. Uh, and I'm also happy to announce that we are joining with Sarah uh, to evaluate that work uh, in the hopes that we can generate more evidence which will be useful not only for people in our community in the downtown east side, uh, but for people here in Kamloops and throughout British Columbia, uh, and indeed the communities throughout the United States and Canada uh, who are suffering the scourge of these entirely preventable deaths. Thank you much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, MJ. We'll actually be holding questions till the end so that we can get through all eight presentations in the day. So thank you. We'll hold that right till the end. And if you have questions for MJ, uh, please feel free to write those down so you don't forget them. I'm sure there's a lot of questions from the audience here, and we just want to make sure we get through everything first. So I want to give a great big heartfelt thanks once again to MJ Malloy for being here today. What an outstanding speaker. And clearly uh, a scientist who is passionate and engaged in this work and who has dedicated his life to finding ways to improve this terrible situation that we have in front of us. And as the numbers are starting to show that despite the worries, the fears, the loss and the grief, that we're starting to see the emergence of some hope.